thank you so much for joining us. We have Ross Cameron of Outsiders, an amazing journalist who uh, I spoke to just a while ago earlier today about this vigil. Thank you for joining us, Ross. I've, I believe you're muted at the moment. Um, at the bottom left-hand corner, you will be able to unmute yourself. It just automatically does that when I promote people to panelist. But thank you for, for being with us. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's nice to join you. Well, it's really interesting to have you back uh, back to back with Greg, because I know that you guys are from different political perspectives. But can you give us some in, uh, your perspective on the absolute media smears and, and uh, corruption when it comes to Julian Assange's case and the misrepresentation of it? And explain why you're di why are you one of the few uh, people with, with a, uh, an establishment media platform that's willing to speak out for Assange? Yeah, well, you know, we in Australia saw Julian awarded the arguably highest award for journalism available when he was given a Walkley Award by the National Press Gallery following the uh, release of really the first major tranche of documents. I think it was uh, during the George W. Bush era and at that time, uh, Julian really attracted a large group of followers uh, in the Australian mainstream media who were basically all of what I would describe as aggressive left orientation, Be not so much because they were pro-Julian as much as they were anti-George W. Bush. And at the time, I was a member of the federal parliament voting in favour of many of the, uh, of the Bush doctrines as far as Australia was implicated as an ally. And then subsequently, uh, when WikiLeaks, following effectively uh, exactly the same principle of transparency, disclosure, um, indicating the, the, the limits of secrecy, um, he began to, for example, publish the Clinton emails. Um, all of those who had previously been uh, cheerleaders of disclosure suddenly uh, went mute. And what that indicated to me was that their support for the principle of disclosure related entirely to the question of whether what you disclosed was something I agreed with or disagreed with. And that's, I think, the um, and the problem for Julian then was he had kind of been perceived by the right, if you like, the establishment, as a troublesome, uh, meddling, uh, irritant figure during the Bush era. Uh, then he basically got dumped uh, like a hot potato by the progressive left, who said, well, if you're not going to continue to support uh, our political agenda, uh, we no longer support the principle of disclosure. And I just thought it was such a transparently um, venal approach to the wider thesis which WikiLeaks uh, and Julian Assange pose. Um, I mean, the truth is I became, Pete, I became an Assange supporter on the record in 2011 when I was when I wrote a piece for the Sydney Morning Herald, which they titled I didn't choose the uh, the sub editors choose the title, but they they called it "Can't Hide Love for WikiLeaks," and um, it's still actually, if I may say, quite a good piece. Um, I recently retweeted it saying that eight years later, I wouldn't change a word of it. And I wrote that after reading, uh, after really reading a, a, bi a more significant bio uh, sort of biography of Julian in one of our mainstream papers, I think it was a Fairfax media paper, where Julian really set out the path by which he became a, a whistleblower, uh, a publisher. And as soon as I read the piece, I knew, I understood that I was being forced to come to grips with a pretty significant new thesis uh, about the nature of public life and, and the public square. 
And I found it, as a conservative, I found his argument um, intensely challenging. Much um, the same way people would say um, that a thoughtful person has to come to grips with the thesis of somebody like Jesus of Nazareth, wherever you arrive, you kind of need to form a view one way or the other about the claims that he makes. I felt a bit the same way about Julian, um, that he was presenting me with a thesis and I found it troubling. I found it almost disturbing. I found my mind returning to it from my original view that he was a kind of self-serving, self-aggrandizing, uh, dangerous figure who was placing the lives at risk of people who were trying to defend the values of Western civilization in difficult places. Uh, but in the end, I just came to the view that whatever my opinion of Julian Assange sort of Esquire, um, I could not... Uh, I couldn't overcome his argument. And at that stage, I just thought, well, you have to submit, you know, whether as a uh, one of the Christians huddled in the catacombs under Rome during the persecution or a citizen of a modern Western democracy, um, I found his argument compelling. And, you know, at the risk of presumption, uh, I'm, I'm happy to give you a summary of what yeah, well, I would get. Well, I think it's really fascinating that um, that you, as opposed to many on the right and the left, who at different times, as you mentioned, have found yeah. Julian Assange's publications to be troubling and disturbing and to ch that challenges their uh, worldview and their allegiances. What is it that, that made you actually, you know, take it seriously and allow it to uh, challenge you, but to actually be uh, have enough integrity and to be honest in saying, I can't, you know, I have to submit to this. Is there something that doesn't happen in, in the minds of other journalists in that sense? Like, what is it that really switched the light bulb for you? Yeah. And look, I probably should say uh, uh, that I, I don't really regard myself as a journalist um, in, in the traditional sense. I think that would be generous. I mean, we I am broadcasting on Sky News, uh, Outsiders, which you were kind enough to join this morning uh, briefly. Um, well, look, my um, view uh, of the WikiLeaks thesis, and others may express it differently or understand it differently, but in terms of my view of it, is that Julian was, was really saying that when it comes to the raw material of data, as so much of our lives have moved out of the analogue realm of direct, say, verbal, audible communication and onto uh, bits, onto the digital sphere, uh, onto that environment where every stroke leaves a mark. Um, then the question of <clears throat> security of the data, of who has access to the data, becomes a very live and real question. And the <clears throat> establishment um, has grown up around an assumption that it is possible to keep data secure. And if you operate on the assumption that it's possible to keep data secure, then it is okay to create privileged classes of people and institution who have access to secure data, who can be trusted as a kind of priesthood, if you like, um, to manage that data and to do various things with that data um, in a way in which is not available uh, to the ordinary person. Um, but I just, but if it is actually no longer possible for agencies to keep data secure, then it becomes a, a very different and difficult question, which is who, who should have access to it. And I just came to the view that whatever your acronym is, whether it is the CIA, uh, MI6, um, the uh, Australian Security Intelligence Service, um, ASIO, um, whatever. 
I find, uh, whether it's the Democratic National Convention, um, the truth is, whether it's a major corporation, a, uh, a trade union, a uh, health insurer, what we find time and time again is that these organisations cannot keep data secure. And it's not so much the risk which is most um, frequently advertised, which is the risk of being hacked by a hostile either foreign intelligence service or perhaps industrial espionage. The truth is that documents get leaked. Whether we like it or not, uh, people inside organisations, whether they are uh, members of the permanent staff, as I believe was the case in relation to the Clinton emails, the Democratic National Convention, where I think we saw an individual inside the Clinton campaign who was shocked by this kind of private, secret, undisclosed, but systematic preference in favour of one Democratic candidate against the other. And that person in a state, a natural state of anger and shock said, well, I, I must, I can't participate in this scam. Um, Likewise, we've, we've seen, for example, in the uh, US Congress, you have to give contractors, uh, IT is so complex that a ordinary lay person has no prospect whatever of seriously managing these uh, millions and hundreds of millions of bits of data. So you have to bring in experts from outside of the organisation who move in and out. Now, those experts may or may not share the values and commitments required to keep the data secure. So uh, we saw the Pakistani brothers who were running the emails of 50 members of the US Congress and to break in, that's the Awan scandal. For, for Awan many of our viewers who know what that's about, that's what you're referencing. Yes. Yeah. Sorry to it's, interrupt. That's okay. No, happy to take happy to take direction. Um, so you then saw this couple of brothers, IT consultants, who were, ba as I read it, were then heading back to Pakistan and sharing the intimate private correspondence of 50 members of Congress with the Pakistani intelligence services, probably just selling it like, you know, out of their jackets on the street corner, you know, for whatever they could get for it. And because they were IT contractors. And so then I just think um, once the data is going to be leaked, um, as we have, as we find just absolutely routinely, uh, say, for example, in New South Wales, we find that you've got an organisation which takes all the driver's licence, all the details required to get a driver's licence, which is your name, your address, your email address, your credit card details. Um, we just find that information becomes commercially valuable to a whole range of people who want access to it. And there's no possible way to stop the risk of, for example, bright people, relatively low paid junior officials being bribed to sell the information. So the question then is, well, if the information is going to be leaked, uh, who should have access to it? And in my judgment, you know, Assange then appears sort of like the white knight um, and says, well, if it's going to be leaked, it should be shared not with some small group of insiders who have privileged access to it, um, it should not just be shared with other foreign intelligence services who may have figured out a way to get access to it. It should not just be shared with major corporations who wind up having, having an a commercial interest in the data, such as we have discovered, for example, with Mark Zuckerberg and, um, uh, you know, Facebook systematically selling data, which they have given an assurance would be private, but selling it for hundreds of millions, indeed billions of dollars, which gives you an indication of the commercial pressure on data. Uh, Assange comes along and says, no, no, that is not the way democracy works. Um, if the data is going to be shared, it should be shared, A, with everybody, and B, it should be shared accurately. And I guess that that was the clincher for me, that was the thing that closed the deal, that I just felt whenever Julian Assange touched data, 
he did so with a great deal of professionalism and care. And if I read something, if I read a cable that had WikiLeaks on the top of it, over time, I came to the instinctive, almost Pavlovian view that I can trust this data. Whether, whatever I feel about its contents, I trust the reliability of the publisher. And so at the same time as my respect for WikiLeaks, which I understand is not just Julian, but it's a whole team of people around him, many of them volunteers, lots of them working out of a passion for the cause, but with incredible skill and care to arrange and publish large amounts of data accurately. And, and that, that just closed the deal for me. I just thought, well, I can't argue against the thesis. And so how, um, after you had that sort of realisation, which, again, is so rare amongst journalists that have a large platform, um, and I think it's really disturbing that more uh, journalists don't value the truth in that way and integrity in that way above ideology. But moving on from that, how did your um, uh, view on WikiLeaks evolve, but also relationship with WikiLeaks, reporting on it when others wouldn't? Um, and what do you think of the story that's that's kind of taken place all the way from 2010 and the mobilization of massive forces from the US government against Assange through to now, where we have him in a situation where he's silenced and cannot speak out on his own behalf. What What is your kind of overview, umbrella view of all of that, that narrative? Yeah, well, I have to confess to you that um, I've gone through, I, I find myself in a, in, in a situation that feels strange to me and uh, where my traditional world looks kind of upside down in that I am, I think, a fairly typical Australian in so far as I have a, an instinctively, I grew up with an instinctively positive attitude towards the United States. I felt tremendous admiration for the, you know, the, if, if you said to me, who are your heroes? Uh, the founding fathers of the United States uh, would have rated very, very highly. I mean, um, you know, uh, James Madison, George uh, Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, um, these guys who sat around in a room uh, drawing on a blank page, a constitution which would become almost like a biblical document to small d Democrats around the world over several centuries um, with this beautiful idea of the citizen at the centre, you know, that all men are created equal um, and that we would actually seek to enshrine, you know, checks and balances in a constitution which was explicitly created to preserve the freedom of the citizen. I just, I was just in love, you know, I, I just fell in love with the American dream and I sort of secretly almost wished Australia could be the 51st state. Um, I travelled to the US as a, as a high school student. I lived with a family in Anderson, Indiana, in Hoosierville, in the home state Interesting. I think, of James Clapper. Um, and um, I, you know, played basketball and uh, I wore the sort of Letterman's um, jacket. Uh, I uh, loved that earthy Midwestern, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville talked about the, the goodness, the greatness of America is the goodness of the American people. And I felt that up close. I felt the hospitality, the openness, the sense of enterprise. And I just thought, you know, this is the greatest nation uh, you know, since the Roman Empire. And yet then I went back at, at the risk of boring you with my, you know, with my own little uh, journey. I went back as a university student and I, as it happened, uh, enrolled at the American University in Washington, D.C. in a course called Congress and Legislative Behaviour. And I got a job working as an intern in the US Congress for a senator from Oregon who was a classic Oregonian, a dovish 
Republican, a guy who was interested in peace and was committed to, had a full-time staffer on his staff whose whole job was to try to address hunger in the world. And I sort of fluked uh, this job on, on Capitol Hill and we worked out of the Hart Senate office building. And once a week, Mark Hatfield, who was a former Attorney General of Oregon and a Abraham Lincoln historian, and um, once a week, he would require me to come and collect him in, from his apartment uh, on, pretty sure it was on C Street. And I'd pick him up and drive him into the office. And during, they had a budget emergency during that Reagan era while I was there. Ted Kennedy had the adjoining office in the Hart Senate office building. And as a young bloke from Australia, um, my, I mean, my eyes were just like, uh, you know, I, I just could not believe what I was seeing. Uh, I drove Hatfield to the White House for the, he was the uh, ranking member, the ranking minority member of the Senate fi uh, Finance Committee. So every bill that went through the Congress had to go through Hatfield's committee. Um, and that the, the initial love that I felt as a high school exchange student was only, only went on steroids. Um, so I came back to Australia fully into, um, you know, the, the NATO, um, the American dream, the US Constitution, the sort of five eyes, uh, whatever, um, you know, whatever Uncle Sam said, I was snapping heels and standing to attention. So I'm, I'm fascinated to hear how, uh, you know, being unable to sort of argue against Julian Assange's arguments and and um, realising that they had integrity, how did all of this change that? Like, have you had any sort of change in perspective on all of that, on your idealisation of the American dream, of Uncle Sam, all of that? How has that yes. changed? Yeah. Look, I think what happened was um, the major, you've got 17 named intelligence agencies in the United States. 17 known ones. There's a range of others we presumably don't know. But I think over a period of time, uh, when you concentrate a great deal of power in one place, there is always the risk that that power uh, will be abused. And I believe that, you know, lots and lots of people, the kind of person who joins the Federal Bureau of Investigation is generally a patriotic you know, law respecting, constitution upholding American citizen. But over time, we just saw the leadership of the FBI, the Department of Justice, CIA, growing into a cosy relationship, I would say a collusive relationship, where the big state really sheared away from its roots, from its mooring in the constitution, in the interest of the citizen, and began serving its own interests. And the organization, which was not meant to have a personality separate from the citizen, came to see itself as having a whole range of structural, institutional interests, uh, which should be defended and preserved regardless of the interests of the citizens. And that became a, a very, very dangerous uh, situation. And I started to see when I just, I could list dozens of, of instances, but when you see on the eve, for example, and I might reveal some of my partisanship here, but you know, I still think they're valid examples that when Hillary Clinton was coming before the Benghazi inquiry in the US Congress, and you find two private jets pulling up on the tarmac with, I think it was Loretta Lynch in one and Bill Clinton in the other, uh, because apparently the modern progressive left, uh, their venue for a meeting is the tarmac of an airport uh, swapping between two private jets. Uh, that's the modern uh, progressive. But Bill Clinton can get a meeting uh, with Loretta if he needs one, you know, but the private citizen who wants to meet with the judge uh, before his or her case uh, will not when we actually saw the contents, for example, of the Clinton email and the relationship between 
the Clinton Foundation and the Obama White House and the extent to which US foreign policy seemed to me to be for sale, that if you were the Crown Prince of Bahrain and you wanted to increase your um, arms contract from 300 million to 600 million, using a fair bit of it against your own citizens, if necessary, including chemical weapons, if you could simply make a $30 million donation to the Clinton Foundation, suddenly you had a meeting with the Secretary of State. And as a citizen, I looked at that and I was shocked. I had been following US foreign policy, you know, pretty much all my life, but very closely for the last three decades. And I found US foreign policy in the Middle East, particularly in relation to Syria, I found it absolutely incoherent. And I could not understand what the United States was trying to achieve. When I saw my own country, when Australia, the UK, who I think have likewise, I have suffered this massive disillusionment with the leadership of the United Kingdom in relation to the behaviour of the intelligence agencies uh, and this kind of uh, sabre-rattling, spear-throwing, insult machine, um, which is it operates entirely independently of principles of habeas corpus, of the Magna Carta, of the uh, millennia of constitutional evolution since Alfred the Great established the jury, the jury system of 12 men, uh, ordinary citizens. And I just saw this degradation and erosion of this precious history because, as I say, I believe these institutions just sheared off their moorings and started acting collectively in a collusional relationship between uh, Western powers. Um, I was embarrassed. Um, I was shocked. Uh, and I just felt I just lost. All of the gloss came off and the um, institutions. I mean, I wanted Boris Johnson to be, uh, I, I was hoping he would be the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. I mean, here was a guy who gave a press conference, having written a book on the biography of London. He gave the book launch 20 minutes, unbroken, without notes, in Latin. You know, a classical scholar. And yet here we find him fully engaged in this absolute bullshit argument about the Skripals, which any, you know, any year 10 social studies student can look at it and say, well, this is obviously garbage. Um, I, you know, it was caused all this dissonance in my brain. And I, I just could see that these agencies were no longer trustworthy. And that, that made me realise more than ever that we needed a citizen's intelligence service, which is what I regard WikiLeaks as being. I think what you're saying is so valuable because it shows how no matter what perspective you come from politically, when you see over and over again the truth being revealed in that way that shows the hypocrisy of, as I think you're referring to, sort of like this security state or the unelected power structure, um, it's just, it's a universal recognition of the truth versus manipulation. And I think it's a great example of the, it just doesn't matter almost what your politic, political background is. And that's, it embodies as well what we're trying to do with this entire vigil, which is to actively say, look, we, we aren't all from the same political sphere. We have really differing uh, political opinions on a lot of the, a lot of issues but we all support Assange because we put truth above ideology. And I think that um, from what you're saying, that I mean, that is the one thing that I think a lot of people that have the same or similar dissonance that you had or experienced, um, if, they, if they value their ideology over integrity and truth, then they don't accept uh, WikiLeaks and what it does. I think that is the dividing line between people who end up supporting WikiLeaks versus not. And I, I wanted to ask you if you felt that way or if you thought there was other uh, other contributors to maybe the people that that support it versus end up not supporting it and kind of submitting to their cognitive dissonance instead of really looking through the truth for the truth. Yeah, I'm guys. Sorry, I'm just moving around trying to get a, um, a better power, power source. Yeah, look, I was. Um, I tell you what, who I was also influenced by. If I'm going to be honest, um, Christine Assange, Julian's mother. Um, amazing, I first, amazing human being. 
Yeah, like she makes relatively few interventions in the public debate. But when I when I listened to her, I found that the kind of natural instincts, the natural maternal instincts of a of, of a mother whose son was in, in trouble. But I just also found an incredibly thoughtful and perceptive Australian, um, lucid, and I I just found sentence after sentence. I'm like nodding, yes, yes, yeah. yes. I agree, with, agree with all that. Um, and I just I suppose that also influenced me in in a way. Um, but yeah, Kevin Rudd, the uh, former Australian Prime Minister. And uh, let me just say, uh, you know, since you've offered me the microphone, I'm so disgusted uh, by the performance of Australia's prime ministers in defending an Australian citizen. I know we've got listeners from all over the world. Uh, but Julian is, is a, you know, um, I'm going to, out of respect for my own mother, try and watch my language here. But I tell you what, I'm seriously ready to unload on these guys and girls. I mean, Julia Gillard, there you have Prime Minister of Australia, sort of besties uh, with Hillary Clinton, um, you know, swan dive uh, with Pike into the swamp uh, of the Clinton Foundation, where we now get this modus operandi that, you know, a whole bunch of world leaders will find, um, you know, like Alexander Downer did, 25 million uh, to donate to this sort of new organism, this sort of quasi-charitable, quasi-state um, and, and quasi-private family enrichment uh, vehicle. If you, if you tip in $25 million while you're in office, uh, we'll find a good role for you, you know, once you're out. And I regarded that as improper and corrosive. But here you had a situation where Julia Gillard comes out and announces that Julian Assange has committed a crime, okay, she's the Prime Minister of Australia. She's got a citizen who's sitting out on the edge of the perch. She pulls out, you know, the chainsaw and starts soaring off the limb, making an allegation that Assange has committed a crime. And so I said, as just one citizen watching, okay, well, you've made the accusation. What is the crime? Tell us, please. You know, what is, the, uh, what is the provision of the Crimes Act that he has offended and what is the evidence you're relying upon which would distinguish him from every other journalist in the world who exactly. is publishing every day of the week? It seems the only crime that he's guilty of is extremely instri- uniquely effective journalism. That seems to be truly what they are punishing well, yes. him for. You are so right, Elizabeth, and, and, and that's what I say. That And then subsequently, you know, some months later, you get uh, Julie Gillard's Attorney General, Rob McClellan, sort of slithering out from, you know, uh, under the rock to say, oh, well, actually, the Australian Federal Police have now examined this case fairly extensively and we have found no crime in, in any Australian... Exactly. You know, exactly. Exactly. Um, then, and that then happens with got... so many narratives that they they come out with a definitive he has committed a crime or this event has happened and it was done by so and so and then a year later it's well there's actually no evidence and you yeah. know we just it's just over and over so and so here we have we've just sent um, George Senator former Senator George Brandis a conservative from Queensland uh, the Attorney General during the um, Abbott and Turnbull era. He's just, um, you know, rolled out of the Senate for his sinecure as the Australian High Commissioner in London, holds himself out as some sort of uh, serious lawyer. Well, um, George Brandis is on the record that Julian Assange has committed no offence. There's no crime record. There's no offence recognised by Australian law that Julian Assange is guilty of. He's a former Attorney General. He's there in London. Um, and he is saying, sweet fuck all, you know, in defence of the Australian citizen who's been persecuted, you know, by the intelligence agencies of 10 countries. And so Absolutely. I say to you, I've got no respect for you. You're a spiv. Absolutely. If you cannot get your ass out of bed and defend an Australian citizen a couple of hundred metres away in the Ecuadorian embassy 
while you're sipping cocktails, wandering around London from event to event, being greeted as High Commissioner, I just think you're a spiv, mate. I've got you're meant to be a Queenslander. You know, I've got no respect for you. I don't know what you're doing there. Just take the sinecure and don't get out of bed because you're no value. I completely agree with all of those sentiments. And I was wondering, given that, given the obvious hypocrisy and corruption of these leaders that refuse to um, advocate for Julian Assange or actually make these sorts of ridiculous false accusations against him, as you just mentioned, with Julia Gillard, et cetera, uh, with this trend, what do you think Australians can do to actively and tangibly support Julian Assange? How can they make a difference in this case when we have leadership that is so either corrupt or power or unwilling to act for Julian? Well, look, I mean, um, I should also mention while we're on that subject, Malcolm Turnbull is likewise on the record as saying um, that he, like this is sort of before he became Prime Minister, he was happy to say that he regarded a science as a publisher like any other. Um, but now, as Prime Minister, you find this completely docile, submissive, obedient uh, figure who is just like a sort of a, a CIA wind-up doll, you know, just hit the button and play. Um, what can a citizen do? It's a good question. I mean, it's a ser- I have seriously been thinking about a hunger strike, you know, because there's just so few options left to us. I have the benefit of a platform on Sky News, um, which gives me a chance to have a crack fairly regularly. A number of my colleagues, when I get to Julian, they go into the eye roll and say, you know, here's Ross on this obsessive compulsive, um, you know, some of my, what I would call, you know, friends, um, senior figures in media and in the liberal uh, national political establishment um, say to me, uh, Ross, you know, what is what, what, what is this Assange thing? You know, you, you, yeah. You, uh, and that's, that's incredible, though, because it, from, from the perspective of many of the viewers, what they see the complete opposite. Like, instead of it being, oh, you're, you know, why are you on this subject again? It's The question is, why aren't more journalists attacking this subject and, and vociferously, you know? So I yeah. think that's very interesting um, that they treat it that way. As Can I tell you, one, what people can do is the basics. <clears throat> yeah. Um, every Australian has a member of parliament. Um, what are there, 176 seats in the House of Representatives. All of those people want to get re-elected. I think it is important to stay on the radar. Um, If you, you know, one of the things that I am embarrassed and disgusted about uh, is the fact that Julian Assange does not have a physical current Australian passport. Yes, that's a huge issue. Thank you for bringing that up. That's a major point that we haven't discussed yet in this vigil. Um, really important so, so to. I, I talk just about. say to Julie Bishop uh, and to uh, Christian Porter and to Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull um, since when did it become lawful to uh, deprive an Australian citizen of his passport? I mean, what, what is this? Is this some sort of, um, you know, is, is this Sierra Leone we're talking about? Is this some sort of tin pot backwater where the executive just decides which, who may have mobility and who may not? I mean, I just find this disgusting. I would support, I'm basically to the stage where I'm ready to support civil disobedience. Um, Julian Assange is a litmus test of the value of Australian citizenship. And what we are discussing, what what we're finding is that actually Australian citizenship has a pretty low value. I mean, there would have been times where I would have said my Australian passport is one of the things that I actually really, really highly value. And if I found myself in a bind anywhere in the world, I would want to be able to produce an Australian passport in the knowledge that the, you know, that the cavalry would arrive if I found myself subject to abuse, intimidation, um, confinement as a consequence of the behaviour of some other nation. 
what we find is an Australian passport is not worth a pinch of shit under Julia Gillard and Malcolm Turnbull, I regret to say. I regret to inform other Australian citizens your passport is not worth the paper it's written on because when you most need one, the government will not even give you one. So even if people say, oh, Julia State should just walk out, I say, well, what's he going to do? He's going to get to the airport. He can't get on a plane. Thanks well, very through- much. The only way he's getting on an airplane at, in the current situation, if he leaves, it will be in custody. And that's a critical point because, I mean, we have there are trolls that endlessly reply to anything supporting Julian Assange saying he can just walk out. And that is totally um, and absolutely not the case, as we all know. And so I just wanted to reiterate that. But I tell you something else that really grinds my gears, Elizabeth. Um, Good phrase. Is when I saw, like, we all, uh, the whole of the political establishment is engaged in this massive, what I regard as massive virtue signalling exercise about, um, you know, the pathologically aggressive, violent uh, male and the rape culture in which uh, Western women have to live. And I think all, um, you know, every thoughtful person can recognise the kind of difference in physical strength of the male and the female and the lifelong vulnerability which that creates, particularly for a woman who is alone wherever she is anywhere in the world. But when you see the manufacture of a rape allegation for a political purpose, which we saw from the government of Sweden, following from WikiLeaks, the touting for business by the US military industrial complex going around to American allies, urging them to find some basis upon which to charge Julian Assange. And so when you had this obvious fabrication of an offence unknown to any other legal jurisdiction anywhere in the world, in which neither of the alleged females involved were complainants, but some grandstanding green politician, And then the subsequent behaviour of the Swedish legal establishment who were colluding with the Crown Prosecutor Service in the United Kingdom, who we learnt were engaged in a deliberate plan to ensure that Julian Assange was not interviewed for six years. I just thought, mate, you know, you, you, you guys are pathetic As somebody who has an affection and respect for the common law tradition, for the most fundamental principles of innocence until proven guilty, of there are various elements, Elizabeth, of the Magna Carta, which are still in force today in the United Kingdom, one of which is that a person must not be held without trial and without charge. Exactly. That is the law today. That dates from Alfred the Great, and yet you have the, you know, this chick, allegedly, this fat bureaucrat running the prosecution of Julian Assange in Sweden, colluding with some other dumb bureaucrat in the Crown Prosecutor Service, and which the Australian government, in response to requests from an Italian journalist for Stephanie the Marici. correspondence... Yes, Yes. that's right, who's appeared on our show a couple of times. Fabulous work. Um, When we ask, can we please see the private correspondence taking place between the Australian Department of the Attorney General, the Crown Prosecutor Service in the UK and the Crown Prosecution in Sweden, which saw an Australian held under intense intimidation now for over seven years. And you've got this chick, Nye, I forget, is it Margaret Nye? What's her name? Um, you know, she's writing in correspondence, oh, look, I'd really love to come and visit London as part of my holidays, uh, but I can't come because if I did, everyone will ask, why haven't you interviewed Julian Assange for the last six years? Or or charged. I mean, it's just unbelievable when you consider not only was uh, was it totally contrived, as you're saying, the whole investigation um, went on so much longer than it should have, but no charge was ever filed. Without a charge. It's, it's absolutely... Uh, mind-boggling that that could take place in a Western democracy. And that is how Julian Assange is, exposes that hypocrisy, is through their treatment of him, in one, at least uh, partly, I think. When you see um, Julian Assange, and I just put myself in his position, and I say, well, 
I mean, if you do a WikiLeaks search on me, there's some fairly, you know, unflattering uh, material which will uh, which which will present. And no doubt the Google algorithm has been arranged to make sure all the worst stuff comes first. Absolutely, um, without question. But if you say Julian Assange, you know, accused rapist, if I punch that in to Google right now, which I won't for fear of, you know, uh, distracting our transmission, but you're going to find tens of millions of entries uh, of a man's reputation. I mean, Elizabeth, we're on this earth but once. Um, there is no plan B. Uh, we only have one reputation. And we have all these people, alleged journalists, who are happy to sit and watch a man's character systematically defined on a completely fabricated, intimidatory political legal process which did not even result in a charge. Absolutely. I find it disgusting. It disgusts me. Absolutely. And it, and it goes beyond, like, in addition to that, they're not only defaming someone with no basis, but they're defaming someone who is also being actively tortured at this very moment as a political prisoner. And that is what the double hypocrisy of that is absolutely incredible um, to myself and to I, I know a lot of WikiLeaks supporters. And I'm so well, thankful that you talk about it, that you're, you're willing to speak out about this and not be cowed, as a lot of journalists, it seems, are, that have platforms like yours. Yeah, well, here you go. You've got Angela Merkel who winds up on on sort of New Year's Eve, a traditional German celebration in a city like Cologne with literally hundreds of young German women being physically and sexually assaulted. Nearly all of the offenders get slinking off into the night without charge, and yet we are going to collude in this completely bogus kangaroo court against one bloke whose offence is he's very good at his job. You know, it's just bullshit. You know, we can't, we can't tolerate it. Absolutely. Uh, so I guess we have about five or six minutes left. Is there anything yeah. else that we haven't addressed that you would like to get out to the public and to Julian Assange's supporters who want to help? Well, look, I just come back and say um, I've never met Julian Assange. Uh, I've never spoken to him. Um, people say to me uh, various things about uh, Julian Assange's personality. I'm not in a position uh, to, um, you know, confirm or deny or really to have an opinion about whether he's arrogant, uh, whether he's dictatorial, uh, whether he's demanding, uh, whether he is, um, you know, putting whatever pejorative adjective you want. All I know is I can't resist his argument. Um, the truth is the agencies that hold our data cannot be trusted to keep it secure, even if they want to, even with the best will in the world. We're at a moment in history where we are creating this unbelievable volume of data. And the truth is it can't be secured. And we should not pretend that it can. The only question we have to answer is what do we do now that we know that much of our private data is at risk and will at some time fall into the public domain? What do we do about this new reality? And I say at this moment in history, we have one bloke who's put his hand up and said, well, this is what I'm prepared to do. Uh, I'm prepared to methodically uh, like an archivist or a librarian, like somebody who cares about the data, like somebody who is determined to represent it fairly and accurately, we can publish it. And that's what we can do with it. We can publish it. We can ensure that there is not a little priesthood of privileged individuals in deep state bureaucracies who will have access to the data. We can ensure that you and I, that mums and dads, that boys and girls, that Ordinary citizens of countries around the world are not prejudiced, are not discriminated against, are not the last ones to learn, but we can learn it as soon as anybody else does. And that is the argument of Assange and WikiLeaks. If someone has, a, if someone can refute it, I'm open 
You know, I am open-minded. If there is a better argument out there about what we should do once our data is systematically compromised as it is, please, please step forward. I'm ready to hear it. But so far, the best argument I have heard comes from uh, an Australian, you know, uh, rabble rouser. He's a bit of a shit stirrer, you know, but he's got the guts to stand up in front of the biggest bullies in the playground and publish. So that's why I support Julian Assange. Incredible thoughts. And I think as well, to, to, uh, going to what you're saying about uh, the insecurity of data, I think when a lot of people, um, especially, you know, within the intelligence community, I see them reacting to the uh, publication of, for example, Vault 7 um, and CIA documents in that regard as this attack against the intelligence community. But really, it's showing them that this is vulnerable, that that da data, as you're saying, is insecure. And so I think that if we had if we had an intelligence community that actually had integrity, they would be looking at that as a, as a thing to say thank you to. Thank you, WikiLeaks, for showing us where we need to improve proof but obviously we don't have that but well you know i look at and even if you look at <laughs> by contradistinction to the meticulous care and accuracy of a wikileaks publication what i see coming out of the mainstream media these once great mastheads um it is in so many cases it is simply fake news it is sort of add water and stir take the current prejudice du jour, whatever it is, of the deep state, whatever the next sort of uh, boneheaded um, assault on human nature we're about to be subjected to, um, you know, uh, crank out. You've got, you know, mastheads which were once so reliable, which were once journals of record, and they just no longer are. And uh, you talk about Vault 7, you know, where we discovered that the CIA is out there actively building and recruiting software platforms which can create the appearance that a foreign government uh, has intervened and hacked data. So citizens naturally have to ask themselves, well, who can we trust? If we know for a fact that the agencies meant to be defending us are deliberately creating distorted narratives as part of this massive counterintelligence establishment where they can stand in front of a visa court on the basis of a document which was funded by one political campaign, which was supported by the intelligence agencies of another nation, which was shopped around through the Department of Justice and the FBI, they can stand in front of an American judge and completely hide the fact of the origins and the provenance of the document in order to create a new political moment. I just say, God bless WikiLeaks. I think that's a, a wonderful note to end it on. Thank you so much, Ross. Ross Cameron of Sky News joining us uh, for this vigil. I cannot tell you what an honour it is to have you with us for this. And I'm, I'm so grateful that at least one journalist with a platform like yours has the integrity to speak out for Julian Assange. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I've enjoyed it.